Gabriel Virde, O Gabriel, thou man of God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This weekend's retreat takes us to the beginning with Gabriel and Our Lady, and the end at Calvary and at Holy Communion of the Incarnation of our Savior. We are meant to see the purpose of the Passion of Christ and its fruit in the Holy Cross, the fruit which we receive by the Holy Communion. Our companion through it all, we pray and beg, will be great Gabriel, whose name means in the Hebrew, the strength of God. St. Gabriel's feast day was introduced by Pope Benedict XV just after World War I so that the church would have a feast day of all three of the known archangels. Gabriel is the great messenger of God whenever strength is required. He came in the Old Testament to Daniel. He saluted Daniel as the man of God and the man of holy desires. Remember, Daniel prayed on a regular basis, three times a day, every day, regardless of the opinion or the persecution of the pagans that surrounded him. And remember that Daniel, too, was thrown into the lion's den, a a figure or type of our Lord. He told Daniel about the coming of redemption and the mystical prophecy of the weeks. And he also told Daniel those important words that the people which would betray and deny our Lord would not be his own. Then comes, uh, just at the beginning of the epoch of the Incarnation, Gabriel to the priest Zachary at this hour, the hour of the evening sacrifice. He is offering up incense at the altar of the temple, and he tells Zachary that in his old age he will father a son who will be John the Baptist. He throws natural objections to it, as we often do with God's will. Well, there's this and then there's that, and we're old and all the rest. And as a punishment, he is struck uh, dumb. He is unable to speak until Zachary is born and, excuse me, John the Baptist is born and named. How different is his next coming? He comes to our Blessed Lady to tell her of God's plan for man's redemption and to receive her consent, her fiat, thy will be done. And what strength, think of it, was required? Our Lady, barely 14 years old, and with her profound humility, that she was chosen to carry God, to be the mother of God, to be the queen of the universe, that she was chosen. And Our Lady, receiving strength from God in her humility, says, Thy will be done. This is not the end of the role of Gabriel. Great Gabriel, we are told, appeared on Christmas night. and He it is who alerted the shepherds to the presence of our Lord and told them to go over and adore the newborn king. Gabriel was the angel who accompanied the Holy Family, particularly for the flight into Egypt and then for their final return to Nazareth and the Holy Land. Last of all, Gabriel comes until now, the agony in the garden. And this time he comes again to receive a consent, a yes to God, and take it home to heaven. But this consent is from Jesus Christ, our Savior himself. And our Lord is so overwhelmed with mortal fear that he would have died in the agony of what he was bearing and and going to bear the next day had Gabriel not given him not not consolation, but strength, comfort, as we saw the other Friday in our Lenten meditation. This consent conducts Christ to Calvary, to the cross. And... Thus, we consider next our Lord on the cross. Today is the devotional feast of the five wounds of our Savior. With these was I wounded, our Lord says in the Old Testament, 
in the house of them that, that loved me. The devotion to the five wounds of our Lord is uh, an ancient devotion and a very important one. Our St. Gertrude the Great would pray very often. They say that throughout her life she prayed 5,466 times in honor of the wounds of our Lord. And our Lord appeared to her with his wounds sort of like shining like roses to say how pleasing that was to him. And he promised to appear to her in the hour of her death and to cover over all of her sins because of her devotion to the five wounds. And our Lord makes the same promise to us when we salute and adore his holy wounds. Because it is such an important devotion, a couple of things happened at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, A devout nun of the Visitation Order in France at Chambéry, um, Sister Mary Martha Chambon, received a, a message from our Lord about the devotion to the five wounds of our Lord with just a short little prayer that could be said, Eternal Father, I offer thee the wounds of our Lord Jesus Christ to heal the wounds of our souls and my Jesus, pardon and mercy through the merits of thy sacred wounds. And these, these, wounds these prayers can be said on the five decades of our rosary beads. They're, just, they're said very easily and very quickly. But our Lord makes very, very great promises. He promises that um, he will grant everything that is asked by the invocation of his holy wounds. And he tells this nun, and, and us in effect too, that we should spread this devotion. And the souls who during life honor and study the wounds of our Lord and have offered them to the Eternal Father for the souls in purgatory, again, the moment of death, will be accompanied by the Holy Virgin and the angels. And our Lord on the cross, all brilliant in glory, will receive and will crown such a soul. Spread the devotion, our Lord says, and we should spread the devotion too. Uh, This was just at the beginning of the 20th century. And just a few years later, of course, our Lord, for the first time in history, gave his stigmata, his five wounds, to a priest, Padre Pio. Now, what I do sometimes, and I recommend it to you, is to say these little prayers, or any prayer you want to, in honor of the five wounds, and then invoke Padre Pio at the same time, because he's a great miracle worker and a great saint. And he's a saint of the five wounds of Christ. Sort of, it's a way, if you will, to practice the two devotions at the same time and to receive very, very great blessings. When you finish your rosary, why not keep your beads out and just say, they can be said very quickly, the, uh, the chaplet is called of the five wounds of our Lord. St. Clair as well wrote beautiful prayers in honor of our Lord's five wounds. Why did our Lord receive these five wounds on the cross? We can look to today's Lenten Mass, and although it is not read this evening, nevertheless I recommend in your spiritual reading at some point during Mass tonight, perhaps that you might read over the Epistle and the Gospel with their beautiful consoling lesson. The Epistle or the lesson tells the story of Moses, the people complaining that they didn't have enough water in the desert. Moses striking the rock twice. St. Paul says the rock was Christ. And when he struck it with a rod of wood twice, that's a symbol of the two pieces of the wood. And when our Lord is nailed to that cross, out comes his grace, the water and the blood that St. John saw. All of the abundance of the seven sacraments, all of that mercy that saving flood to wash all of our sins away and at the same time to refresh us. Then in the gospel, we have the story uh, in the Lenten Mass of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. It's a wonderful story which starts out, St. John says, about our Lord at noon on Friday, we're meant to think of Good Friday, sitting at the well and being tired. Our Lord feels a weakness and he's tired in order that you and I can get this water of eternal life and drink it 
and never spiritually be tired again. Always have the strength, the energy that we need to go about and to carry out God's will. A wonderful example of that is the Samaritan woman who gets converted. Here she is, a very great sinner, a lady who has had five husbands and wanted to engage our Lord in an argument about religion because she was a Samaritan and not, and not a Jew. But our Lord comes for everybody. He comes for the good and the bad. He comes for the Jews and he comes for the Gentiles. He comes for the ladies that have five husbands and he comes for people that just argue about religion. Our Lord comes for all of us. And it's a wonderful thought St. Thomas Aquinas gives us that this Samaritan woman becomes right away an apostle of Christ and using just the right terms without being overbearing or driving her potential converts off, she gets them to come to Christ. And she says, come and see whether or not he's the Messiah. So she doesn't try to force him on them. He knows, she knows our Lord will do the rest as our Lord did it for her. That's how our Lord is always doing it. Filling souls who are, who are thirsty with his grace, washing souls who are dirty with his precious blood and his plentiful forgiveness. The strength that the Samaritan woman received, she communicates to others. Well, there will be a lot that needs to be said. That's the nature of a retreat. A lot of words are said. But remember, too, the importance of silence. And remember, too, the importance of thirst. And remember, too, that our Lord is the one who comes to give us a drink. If only we're a little bit thirsty, at least, with the water, the living water, which comes out of his five holy wounds. And with that water, we get strength, a kind of a Gabriel-like strength to say yes to God. Not consolation so much as comfort, the strength to say yes. I conclude with a poem from the 19th century, was written by Christina Rossetti, that alludes to Moses striking the rock and it sets a good tone and, and, and gives us something for which we should ask a grace during this retreat. Am I a stone and not a sheep that I can stand, O Christ, beneath thy cross to number drop by drop thy blood's slow loss and yet not weep? Not so those women loved who with exceeding grief lamented thee not so fallen Peter weeping bitterly, not so the thief was moved, not so the sun and moon which hid their faces in the starless sky, a horror of great darkness at broad noon, I, only I, yet give not o'er, but seek thy sheep, true shepherd of the flock, greater than Moses, turn and look once more, and smite a rock. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen.